In this year's annual Richard Gray Visual Arts Series, architect, futurist, and IIT faculty Marshall Brown converses with Georgine Theodore and Stephanie Smith. In this program, they will review collective proposals from architecture and design firms, independent designers, and activists who will set their imagination to envisioning the city of the future. The proposals explore various what-if scenarios, which provoke a range of diverse discussion topics, such as varying degrees and issues of corporate and municipal hybridization, integrating increasingly accessible technology into urban planning, including social justice frameworks in the urban design process, and democratizing the planning process. This program was recorded on November 13th, 2011. Thank you for coming out for this afternoon's discussion. So I'm here with um, two wonderful colleagues, Marshall Brown, who is an architect and urban designer. He's the principal of Marshall Brown Projects and assistant professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and Georgine Theodore. Georgine is um, a co-founder and principal at Innerboro Partners, which is based in uh, Brooklyn, New York. She's also an architect and designer herself as well as associate professor and director of the uh, infrastructure planning program at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. They're also really dear friends. So that's part of the pleasure of this afternoon's conversation is that it's really coming out of years of informal conversation about this um, kind of energetic overlap between art, architecture, and urbanism. And it's um, the first time that we've formally sat down to collaborate, but hopefully will be the beginning of a longer um, and more kind of formalized discussion. And it's, um, it's an opportunity for us to think together about the power of um, visualizing the future and to think about the, um, the ways that within creative as well as technical fields, it's incredibly important to push ourselves to consider what the future might hold, and then to translate those ideas into words, into images, into experiences that can help us think together about how things might be different in the future and how we might um, use that future possibility as a way to inflect the decisions that we make right here, right now, in the present. So today's project, you can think about it as a kind of kickstart for the urban imagination. We're doing that through um, a specific technique, which Marshall will explain. That's called the Minority Report. So before I begin, I would like to give a special thanks to both Georgine and Stephanie for working with me on this project. They are really two of the finest minds in their fields um, that I've had the chance to encounter. So I'd just like to give them both a round <laughs> of applause. Without them, this would not have been possible, but okay, enough with the nicety, school's in session. Um, what are the minority reports? You may be, of course, uh, familiar with the science fiction story by Philip K. Dick, which later became a Steven Spielberg film t starring Tom Cruise. Um, the story centers around a trio of humanoid, uh, what are called precogs, a kind of hive mind that can predict crimes that haven't happened, but it turns out they don't always agree. Um, so the Minority Report is really about a glitch in the consensus machine. So there's the three of us, right? And I'm the contrarian one at the bottom. <laughs> However, um, the Minority Report is also a real kind of document used in uh, scenario planning and future studies to issue a dissenting opinion uh, within a strategic conversation. So we're interested in actually simply finding the missed opportunities and blind spots um, that minority reports are designed to expose. Our aspiration is that this is really an exercise in expanding the urban imagination. So we asked our contributors to do the following. Number one, submit a short narrative about the development of their city over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, the narratives actually took several forms, which you'll see, such as forecasts, manifestos, memorandums, histories of the future, etc. In addition, we ask for some supporting images, such as diagrams, maps, collages, et cetera. And our hope was that these documents would not simply extend the dominant narratives that we, so many of us hear today on uh, American urbanism, especially with regard to ecological fear or technological determinism or shrinking cities, but actually we're interested more in alternative, uh, contrarian, and even surprising um, urban futures based on, but not 
bound by current realities. So what you're seeing here today is really a rough draft, the first part of a conversation which we hope will extend on into uh, the future. Okay, so um, let me introduce our contributors, uh, the people we refer to as our manifestees. Um, we invited a small group um, and we had the following criteria. The first was that they would be sort of youngish, um, people with emerging voices, not yet dominating their field, um, but who may soon be. And we were interested in having different disciplines represented. Um, so uh, you'll see here that we have contributors who come, who come from architecture, from urban design, landscape architecture, and so on. Um, but we tried to focus on particular actors that strongly influence city making. And while we've categorized these manifestees by their disciplines, uh, we were also looking for people whose practices were interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, people who worked across different fields. And we focused specifically on American cities. Um, and as you can see from this map, we also wanted to have some geographic spread, so we have people coming from all over the country. And finally, um, if you want to know more, but we're going to sort of give you a little bit of an overview about all the projects, but if you want to find more information about any of the contributors, um, you can actually find them on the City of the Future webpage on the Chicago Humanities Festival website. Yeah, so we got a lot of really fantastic um, submissions, much more, um, there's much more detail than we really have uh, the opportunity to go into in depth today. So in order to, to think about some ways to help you um, kind of go along on this, on this trip with us, we decided to divide, um, to come up with, uh, with different kinds of thematic pairs that would suggest some of the thematic connections that run across the submissions. So um, it, just to give you a sense of how the rest of this is going to flow, I will introduce each of these pairs and then um, Georgine and Marshall will each explain one project. We'll discuss um, the projects a little bit back and forth and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So, um, so let's go into the first of these projects, um, which we gave the title Wet Dreams. And these are two projects that pose the question, what if we rethink roads and other urban spaces as a new form of green infrastructure, where cars and asphalt are replaced by plants, bikes, and trains in response to perceived environmental threats? So the first project is from David Fletcher, who's a landscape architect based in San Francisco, also practicing in Los Angeles. And what you're seeing here in this image is a kind of really radical reconstruction of Los Angeles, um, sort of after a series, <laughs> right, after a series of uh, environmental, economic, um, infrastructural sort of collapses and disasters. So the existing road and highway infrastructure is replaced by a new hybrid system of flows that carry everything from water to trains to sewage. And then on this next slide, you actually see how uh, David has been very precise about charting out the transformation of the city uh, over time, over the next century or so. And then in the section below, you can see how his, sense, his new idea about these uh, tubes, essentially called flows, which carry these different kinds of resources, interact with the, um, these new urban centers, uh, which are called focus. And then there's these other kinds of landscapes which exist beyond called fuzz. Okay, the second project in this pair is by Matthew Nicolette and Alan Shearer. Uh, they're both landscape architects practicing in Austin, Texas. And this project, Keep Austin Weird, um, has some similar underlying strategies as the Fletcher scheme, which we just saw, basically like turning roads into green carless corridors. Um, however, in this project, the existing city remains. Um, so, um, and we're also presented with a very different representational style. Here we see the capital on axis, we see the sort of the buildings rendered. But in both cases, the city kind of becomes a green sponge. Yeah, so um, actually, uh, Georgina, it's one point of clarification. Could you explain weird versus weird? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, uh, the city of Austin has a slogan, keep Austin weir weird. Um, but they actually, in their proposal, they put an extra E in between the weir and the ed because they were making reference to weirs, this kind of infrastructure that basically holds water in dams. Um, you know, that project is um, really sort of in response to some of the sort of really cat the, the catastrophic drought that, drought that um, 
that Austin and other cities in Texas are facing today. Yeah, and Marshall, if you could say a little bit about what you what you see as um, some of the, the key commonalities and differences between these projects. Well, what I see in common with these projects, first of all, is one of the challenges of the general exercise, which is kind of uh, these 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 projects actually are still heavily invested in the notion of environmental degradation and apocalypse, et cetera, for better or for worse, which is not to deny those things, but what I think the projects show is the difficulty that we have sometimes of breaking out of the kind of commonly held views about the future of our cities as much as anything else. Yeah, and, and, and one thing that we were talking about earlier was also about the ways that, you know, one of them is really based on this idea of total collapse and move, starting from a point of total entropy and the other dealing with the existing situation and then kind of developing within a certain uh, assumed stasis. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say, Georgia? No. no? Okay. So... Um, these, the next two projects um, involve a, a disciplinary shift. So um, here we have two artists who are um, proposing that we do everything yourself everywhere all the time. These are visions about individual actions that add up to collective transformation of the public realm. Okay, so the first project is by John Brummett and Sarah Wagner. They're two artists um, based um, and working in Detroit. Um, and this is a project about Detroit, and it has a totally different um, format from the previous entries. Um, it was presented as a written narrative in two voices, um, one of a father and one of a son, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, one, um, one voice is in the present, um, that's spoken by the father, and the other is in the future, 50 years from now, spoken by the son. Um, or as the authors stated, one of the present talking of the future and one of the future talking of the past. And in this dialogue, the father is a bit more cynical um, and the son is a bit more optimistic. And the dialogue is a sort of the core strategy um, and, they, and there's a number of diagrams that um, emerge out of that play. And the diagrams represent a sort of strategy of absurdist humor um, that sort of opens up other possibilities and ex explodes the doom and gloom uh, uh, that's normally sort of, uh, sort of circling around the post-industrial city. So in this diagram here, you can see um, on the right, there's a sort of a, a silhouette of a sort of a, a, a factory in the post-industrial landscape, and you see sort of two kidneys um, sort of sprouting out of that, um, so, sort, of cleaning, sort of cleaning the sort of the things that are coming out of that sort of industrial machine. And on the left, we have a, um, a person sort of powering in a sort of an elevator. Um, and so these, um, they sort of describe the absur absurd in the present, and their sort of scenario imagines a kind of future of piling on um, those absurdities. So Kim Beck is an artist based in Pittsburgh who actually focuses on um, the periphery of cities and suburban development. And um, her project, uh, and we're going to do a slightly deeper dive into this one, is called The Geography of Somewhere. And it really imagines a world in which citizens are free to display messages physical messages anywhere and everywhere about anything from the scale of a skyscraper uh, to the scale of a forest in their front yard or even on their dog, for example. So next slide. And um, I'm going to read you a short excerpt from her, her report in my future computer voice. <laughs> Here's to a sign at the city limits of Pittsburgh reading, quote, city of signs and throughout the municipality more signs, more direction, more instruction, more regulation, more information, more communication. This isn't the geography of nowhere, it's the geography of somewhere, where everywhere is named and known and explained. Fragmentation of society is healed through communication in real space. Alienation and sprawl is cured at number 546 East End Avenue crosses to number 545 whose sign reads, I'm sad. Images uploaded to Facebook are rear projected on front windows. This is a collage city, a Kurt Schwitter's world where information abuts disinformation. While City Beautiful and Highway Beautification Act sought to eliminate signs, the new city of endless, boundless graphical information will create a field of communication possibility. So, um one of the things that, that we were um, struck by with both of these uh, presentations is their kind of playful use of different voices. And Georgina, I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. Well, I think that both of these projects um, are remarkable for in the way that they sort of give voice to 
uh, people in the city who don't normally are normally part of that sort of um, uh, the sort of the the, the larger dialogue. Uh, they do them in very different ways. Um, I very much appreciate the way that um, uh, Kim Beck's project, uh, I think, kind of approaches this um, in uh, uh, in a way that sort of acknowledges that we have a lot of um, we can be uh, we can be sort of a little bit uncomfortable with the way in which um, people's voices are um, people's private thoughts are sort of becoming public through the use of like Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, I think there's a kind of beauty to the way with which um, uh, people's voices are being uh, projected and then therefore um, being acknowledged by the sort of the larger the larger public. Um, I think on the other hand, um, the the first project that we looked at. Um, John Brummett and Sarah Wagner's project. It's not about multiplicity of voices. It's about sort of the voice of just two people in one city. Um, but I think it's um, a really it's similar in the fact that it's giving voice to a story that's not normally heard in the sort of the post-industrial landscape. I think that often when um, we hear narratives about, uh, say, Detroit and other cities that have lost population, it's always sort of like a narrative of loss. And here, it's I think much more nuanced and a little bit more complex, where there's um, both sort of acknowledgement that there are problems, but at the same time, it's imbued with a kind of optimism. Mm -hmm. I think there's also something important to recognize here, which is just the the rhetorical power of humor. And this is something that's actually um, uh, part of the instruction in doing scenario planning exercises that, you know, when you make jokes about things or you do things in a humorous way, it actually opens people's minds to the possibility. And so here we have two artists, which I think, who I think much more than those of us in, uh, let's say, the field of architecture, for example, are willing to sort of use humor outright to sort of blow our minds open to the point where we can, it, can then accept other realities. So you all can't read this, but the sign at the top says, I'm pregnant and you're the dad. <laughs> and the one below just says, that, that was the sign that just says, I'm sad. And so these, were, these, uh, th these images for me were, you know, even though are incredibly simple, um, really uh, are, are quite powerful. Well, and it's interesting then to think about, you know, uh, these different um, modes of communication in terms of, you know, the, the sort of the confrontation versus the invitation for connection, you know. And, um, and another piece that, that um, is useful as a contrast to the earlier two um, projects is uh, the, these different models of, of, of kind of larger um, planning processes that are stemming from uh, massive infrastructural decisions versus others that are about this kind of accumulation of small actions. So the next two, um, two projects, um, Occupy the Block, um, pose a question about what might happen if we were to reform the suburban block and parcel and do that in such a way as to perforate the boundary between public and private. Okay, so the, um, the first contributor we have here is James Rojas. Uh, he's an LA-based planner and activist. Um, and like some of the presenters we saw in the last group, he's very interested in how play can be incorporated into city making. Um, and his project visualizes the potential of a everyday practice, something that people on the ground are already doing that has great value. Um, here he's looking at the ways um, that Latinos in East LA are using their front yard, um, the fence, the yard, the porch. And he argues that this privately owned land um, becomes a quasi-public space. Um, so instead of the sort of the traditional manicured and occupied lawn that we sort of know so well in American suburban landscapes, here we see something that's more akin to the courtyard and the plaza. So if we look at the sort of the axonometrics at the top of that previous slide, um, on the left, just to sort of show you what we're looking at on the left, um, we see a sort of like a typology that he associates with uh, the sort of Latino home cultures like in Mexico where you have the courtyard house. The second one is the sort of the traditional um, you know, single family home sitting on the lawn. And then the third one is this kind of hybrid condition where the sort of the front yard becomes a kind of courtyard um, for the Latino family. On the bottom we see an image of that. And then in the second one we see a sort of looking um, more in plan of kind of a typical suburban block where we have individual lots, each one with a detached home. And here, I don't know if we can, I don't know if you can um, read the words, but Stephanie will point them out. That's the street um, which he actually refers to as a kind of a plaza. And then the, um, in front of the, uh, the house, 
the front lawn um, uh, uh, becomes a sort of what he calls the, the courtyard. So it's really like transforming these kinds of um, uh, uh, sort of unused spaces of the suburban landscape into something productive and public. Yeah, and, and, and also sort of posing a question of what, what would happen if uh, in a condition of kind of proliferation and embrace of that practice. Mm -hmm. So the next project in this category of occupying the block is by Aziza Chowney, who's actually a Moroccan architect practicing in uh, Toronto currently. She's based in Toronto. Um, we're counting Toronto as an American city. Uh, <laughs> Don't tell the Canadians. <laughs> Don't tell the Canadians. And uh, it starts with this sort of fake newspaper, which, um, well, Toronto Star is a real newspaper, but this fake news spread, which Aziza designed and created for us, um, created for you. And it, so the basic scenario which she proposes is one in which the city of Toronto actually secedes from the province and then needs new sites of increased density. So Aziza actually focuses in on one site that could be exploited, which is the, um, the, the area between the, the back of the houses, which they call the laneway, what we would call an alley. Um, maybe that's the Queen's English or, or something. Uh, what we call alleys. And, and so she really imagines a future where these giant robots, which I must confess that I love, uh, yeah. called smart cranes, enable the construction of new housing in this kind of in-between space. So if we go to the next slide, you can see a detail. So on the far left and right, you see existing houses. And then in the middle, those two sort of towers, which also extend underground, are new, what she calls off-the-grid housing units that fill in the backyards and are accessed from the laneways themselves. And then at the far right of the image, you can even see where there's a little elevator for a, a, a solar-powered elevator for a smart car. But yes, giant robots. So, um, so again, you know, this is another um, instance where we have um, humor that's being put to put to use. Um, but I wonder if, if you guys could speculate a little bit about what the um, what, what did these projects have to have to tell us that's useful as we think about the future of cities. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think one of the one of the really important things is that um, we need to think about reconfiguration as much as growth. There's a lot of discussion these days about growth and our lack of growth, but both of these projects more or less operate on, on growth, even though Aziza's uh, project is about the need for new space for, for immigrants and new density, but there's still an idea about uh, reconfiguring existing lots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's the strength of the two projects, that they sort of work with the kind of framework of the street and blocks that are, you know, really so dominant in the American landscape and comes up with sort of innovative um, ways to um, make them better. Um, so it's not starting from scratch. It's not kind of this, you know, uh, sci-fi future. Um, it's really something that works with the existing conditions. I think that they do them in slightly different ways. Um, I think that James's project um, is so interesting because it's really about observing this practice that already exists and in a way valorizes it. And I think it sort of touches on some of the, um, the sort of themes that we discussed um, earlier about um, you know, giving voice to other things that are happening in the city and saying that it's important. Um, so I think that um, you know, that project is very important in that way. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and I and I and I think Aziz's is in a bit of another tradition, which is a tradition in architecture, which is the idea of these sort of giant walking machines. Uh, some of you may know a project from the '60s by Archigram, where they actually propose walking cities, and so I think there's a clear reference um, to that as a sort of blatantly futuristic uh, idea. Yeah, and um, and one other you know one one other thing to mention is that um, this this tactic of of um, in a way, trying to claim a certain uh, extra legitimacy for this this notion of what a future might look like by using official-looking stuff like yeah. newspapers and press releases. That's something that a lot of the um, a lot of the the manifestees chose to do for us. Um, so we were really impressed by the level of uh, the kind of commitment you know that went into creating these materials. So um, the next the next set of proposals. They, they go in a slightly different direction, so we're going to treat them a little differently. We were thinking of this almost as the intermission um, in, the middle of the, um, in the middle of the set of presentations because these two projects were created by, um, by people who are, are really, um, they're creative practitioners who are really embedded in the present and really dealing with questions of social justice and have chose not to speculate about the future. 
So we're calling them minority reports within the minority reports. Uh, the first is by um, Aaron Levy, who is a, an urban curator and the director of the Slot Foundation in Philadelphia, which has a program that mixes art and design and activism, and they're really thinking about um, ways of getting people talking about, um, about things, the ways that the world might be different right here and right now. And so in, um, in the spirit of that dialogue about social change, rather than um, envisioning any particular possible future, Aaron focused on how to achieve a different present by asking some what if questions. So, um, so some thoughts about you know, what if American society were to privilege hospitality as one of its highest values? What kinds of urban institutions might we put into place in order to support the exchange of ideas around um, the usual disciplines uh, or boundaries of disciplines, class, race, and so forth. What might the city look like in the future if we started asking those kinds of questions? Um, Damon Rich is an artist and urban designer who's working as a designer and waterfront planner actually for the city of Newark. And Damon uses pedagogy as a way to engage broader publics in thinking about how to improve cities. And he's actually you know, on the ground doing this with some you know, pretty massive civic uh, resources behind him. And his proposal suggests some ways that um, we could work, again, in the present, right here, right now, to bring everyday citizens into planning processes. So, um, and, and his practice is also in a way about the kind of the limits of architecture to actually be um, uh, effective as an actor within these situations. So, so we were interested in thinking about the sort of refusal to participate in the project that we had set out and wanted to turn that over to Georgina and Marshall. Well, I'm glad that they did it. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is, I think that um, even though they seem to be different than some of the other projects that we've seen today, I think some, we can sort of talk about some of the, the, the themes that their projects raise, because I think they're inter interconnected to the other ones. And I think, like, uh, for example, I know that in, in, well, in Damon's text, which we, we're not going to read right now, he talked about how when he first became uh, sort of a member of the, the, the city's team in, in Newark, he sort of asked himself, like, really, what can architecture do in this particular context, you know, a context of, you know, major disinvestment, um, uh, economic problems, um, you know, a, a sort of a, a degraded, um, you know, physical environment in the city and so on and so forth. And so I think he was very um, cognizant and cognizant of the limits of architecture in that, in that, kind, of, in that kind of condition. And I think that um, one of the things that the two projects do, and I think, you know, all the projects do in, in, some, in some level or another, sort of say that architecture can't operate on its own. And um, I think that's a really sort of important, I think it's a really important point to make today. I mean, I was, I'll, I'll confess, I was a little bit annoyed at first. <laughs> but um, it's, these two projects actually uh, remind me of the sort of debate about whether a city is simply the sum of its inhabitants at any given time, whether the city is the people in the city, or whether the city is a kind of in, almost independent corporal entity that actually exists through time and it exceeds any one of us or any group of us, right? Because the city, it kind of goes on. It was there before we got here and it goes on afterwards. And I, and I think it's an important conversation to have, especially when talking about this question of, of, of the future. So um, I'm not sure that any, either position is right in either situa in any conversation, but there is, I think for us, especially as practitioners, this tension between those two, uh, I think, sort of competing realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing that I, that I think is worth calling out is the, um, the, the fact that both, of, um, both Aaron and, um, and Damon are really interested in getting people talking and getting people looking around and thinking about what's really happening now, how might it be different, and how they might actually themselves become active participants in, in shaping their cities, shaping the future of their cities. And that's, you know, that's in a way the, um, uh, the benefit of, having, of, of us going through this exercise with you today as well, you know, just thinking about um, what we might what, what we might be able to catalyze, how we might be able to um, think together about what might be. Can I, I just yeah. also, I mean, because maybe it's also good to sort of give specific examples. I think that, you know, um, in Damon's, um, in Damon's contribution, he talked about the city's 
current efforts to redo its for, uh, waterfront, and he talked about some of the practices that they're currently employing, which um, on the one hand range from like, you know, not having a sort of a typical master plan, where in fact like the kind of the needs and the desires of um, individuals and community groups and these other sort of like sub atoms of the city are sort of influencing the design process, but also using um, the education and sort of uh, uh, integration of kids, of young people in planning processes and sort of get them excited to understand, like, to, to see what's happening and to sort of understand these processes and then to, in a, in a way, really democratize the sort of the, pl the, the planning process. Which um, I think we'll, we'll come back to a little bit at the end because um, I know Marshall is not such a fan of the democratization. So. I am so anti-democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that characterization. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to stir it up a little. So, um, but but for now, um, we'll move into two other um, projects that deal with the power of boundaries. Um, they ask another kind of "what if" question. The, their question is, you know, what what would happen if a couple of major areas um, within the New York region were utterly redefined? Okay, so this project from Kaya Kuhl, um, who is a German planner based in Brooklyn is really a written history of the future that looks at the failure of uh, the Manhattanville expansion by Columbia University, which some of you may know something about from reading the New York Times, which I imagine the Humanities Festival crowd reads, right? The New York Times. And, and so uh, she looks at the future of Manhattanville um, and basically speculates about a potential failure of the entire development um, based on shifting demographics, uh, within the global landscape of higher education. So as more universities get built in China, in Brazil, and other, and other uh, developing countries, there, there's actually less of a demand for the kind of expansion which we're seeing amongst several high-level American universities. So um, her idea is that the city would kind of ironically wind up looking much as it looks today. And so in many ways we see this project as a, as a sort of critique of the conventional master plan as a tool for envisioning the future. It's a project really about colonization and the, and the roles of institutions and businesses in remaking the, the city in a less than progressive way. Yeah, and actually, Marshall, if we could just back up for a second and just say briefly, what is Manhattanville? Like, what is that project? Right, so Columbia University has been expanding to the north and west, right? They have a plan which is in, pro in progress uh, to expand to the north and west into what used to be called Harlem and they've basically rebranded re it Manhattanville. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, so Georgine. Okay, yeah. and so the next project um, of that pair is by Gabrielle Esperdi. Um, she's an architectural historian based in New York City. Um, and her project envisions a part of New Jersey seceding um, and being annexed by New York City. Um, to make a larger and more robust metropolitan region. I'm not sure if on the screen right now you can see, but maybe yeah, yeah, Stephanie, Stephanie is going to outline that sort of the sort of seven boroughs of New York City, <laughs> and, um, uh, and 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 speculates about the benefits of what uh, that sort of annexation um, uh, would do um, in terms of like having a merged uh, public transit system and a seriously expanded park and greenway network. Um, and with Gabrielle's project, we really um, enjoyed the representational technique that she, she used. On the right, you can see that she has this, um, she used a press release uh, to present her scenario. And she also used the sort of the fake discovery of a treasure trove of digital documents um, to unfold her narrative. And so this project um, on, uh, really combines deep critical thinking about uh, metropolitan governance um, and a true playfulness in setting up the scenario. Yeah, and, and, and one thing we were really taken by with this one is just the simplicity of the gesture in, in one way, just to say, what happens if, you know, we take a line that, that, that was drawn in one place and then we draw it someplace else, and how, how could that simple gesture help us think about a huge territory in, in a way that could be really generative? Um, yeah, so what, what else do you guys want to kind of, you know, people to take away from these projects? Well, I think that um, in these two projects, um, I'm really, I think it's really great the way that the boundary is um, 
uh, the, the power of the boundary is presented in very, very different ways. I think one, uh, one on the one hand sort of really represents um, the boundary as a kind of exclusionary tool, and the other represents the boundary as an inclusionary tool. So in the case of Gabrielle's project, the, the boundary is actually bringing these different um, entities together, and the sort of the inclusion of those extra entities reaps a benefit for everyone. Um, on the flip side, the sort of the, the boundary that's sort of um, established by Columbia in the sort of Manhattanville area is about exclusion. It's saying, okay, this is our property and things that are there now have to move out and we just have our campus facilities there. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an unintended consequence. We didn't know that it would happen that way, but I think it's really interesting to sort of explore it from those two perspectives. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm gonna make fewer value judgments. But uh, I think that I agree that there is in this in this interest in the the power of the boundary in in the sense that it, it's a reminder that cities are always changing, always changing, and it's very easy for us to get a sense of uh, the city as it is, as we know it. But these projects show that the boundaries of cities are always shifting, and that whole cities even sometimes move. Capitals get relocated, uh, neighborhoods disappear, and if there's one thing that all cities have in common, I think, is that they're all different and they're all always changing. Mm -hmm. I think, may I make another yeah, comment? Sure. Or we just, okay, on time. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. go. Um, I think another thing that's interesting about the two projects is that at, I think it raises issues about sort of public versus private actors. Um, I think that, you know, on the one hand, with the um, with Gabrielle's project, we see the the sort of the uh, say the the governments and the sort of the various cities sort of city actors sort of establishing the boundary on the other hand we see sort of a private entity sort of really becoming very powerful yeah. and I think that that play between public and private is also of interest and mm -hmm. that's a perfect segue into the um, final pair of projects we wanted to share with you before moving into a more open discussion and these logistics landscapes are projects that extrapolate from um, current and um, consumer and corporate behavior and um, use that as a kind of springboard to envision entirely new forms of urban infrastructure. So um, Claire Lister, who's an architect based in Chicago, representing the home team, um, she is looking at the death of shopping as a public activity due to the success of organizations like Amazon and FedEx. So since you can get everything uh, in your home, shipped to you in time, on demand, why would you ever need to go to Michigan Avenue? Uh, this is actually a view of State Street, though, I think, on the, on the right. Uh, so she's really proposing in a very architectural way, in a very specific and architectural way, the expansion of the FedEx drop-off node as a significant uh, architectural piece and social hub in the city where different activities lure people inside. So you can find things in there, not just the place to drop off your uh, overnight packages, but also uh, things like swimming pools, community centers, dry cleaning, uh, schools, daycare, uh, other kinds of grocery shopping, uh, et cetera. And so these are some diagrams which talk about the programmatic mix over time on the right, and then how all of these smaller programs get kind of eaten up by the big fish of, of FedEx. Okay, the second project um, is by Jesse Le Cavalier. He's an architect who's been conducting a multi-year research project on Walmart. And this one I'm just going to go in a little bit more um, depth. Um, this project took uh, the scenario planning part of the initial call very seriously. Um, and we admired the way that Jesse generated his scenarios. Um, so his project starts with um, four different scenarios about the future of Walmart, um, uh, sort of uh, with varying degrees of regulation and consolidation. So here you can see on the y-axis um, we have sort of the legislative spectrum uh, ranging from regulation uh, to deregulation. And on the x-axis you can see different um, corporate spatial strategies ranging from consolidation to fragmentation. Um, so Jesse um, uh, chose uh, to develop the scenario of regulation and consolidation, which I think is in the lower right corner, upper left, upper left excuse me. And um, uh, here, increased regulation results in a corporate strategy of consolidation. What does that mean? Um, in this scenario, the FTC um, charges Walmart a usage fee 
uh, for using the highway system. What's the FTC? The Federal Trade Commission. Um, and in uh, response, um, Walmart decides to build its own transportation system. Um, and uh, uh, sort of with public um, uh, infrastructure crumbling, citizens start using this private network, of course, for a small usage fee. Um, and this results um, in new settlement and investment patterns, so people sort of follow, follow this um, and use this new system. Um, and so the, uh, Jesse very effectively um, appropriated the uh, format of the press release, which you can see on the right side, um, uh, mimic mimicking a language we might call Walmish. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, Walmart, uh, so what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of an excerpt from the, from the press release because we think, it's, uh, we think it's so descriptive and good. Um, I don't know if I can use the same voice that Walt, that, um, that Marshall used earlier, but I'll just... Why don't you I'll, try a Southern, an Arkansas accent? Yeah, that'll go really well. <laughs> How about that? I don't know about that. Um, Walmart to celebrate its 100th anniversary by offering free pickups to all nodes in meshes one through four. The organization and its history will be celebrated in entertainment quarters throughout all hubs. Of particular significance during the festivities will be multimedia presentations on the triumph of private sector infrastructure development. After all, it was only through the regulation reforms, a series of prohibitive and obstructionist taxation policies, that the organization was barred from sharing the country's collective infrastructure. Rather than, st than submit to these barriers, Walmart, in the spirit of innovation and risk taking, leveraged its logistics and infrastructural expertise and built the conduit system now appreciated and used by so many Americans. While these were initially intended only for the retailer to control distribution costs, the opt-in infrastructure policy soon allowed every American to take part in the affordable and efficient services provided by Walmart. That got very sinister. You give yourself away. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the next slide, we can um, see some of the drawings of this network. Um, it's presented almost like an aerial scan of this privatized infrastructural network, um, a system that emerges from the extreme logics of logistics. Yeah, and, and one thing I think it's important to point out with this is um, the, 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 the thought of this, you know, incredibly uh, massive transformation that would be, you know, of course generated out of this, this corporate, this, this kind of conflation of government and, and corporate um, energies, but also that um, this would yield to new kinds of, of, of um, urban-ish settlements that would be happening all over the country in places that we haven't um, thought of as potential centers in the past. So, um, so, so let's dig into it a little bit more. I mean, Marshall, one, one thing that you had men mentioned in the past, um, when we were talking earlier, is about how you know everything in the future comes from the past, and you brought up the the, the example of, of the the railroad system. Right. I mean, what was interesting a couple of years ago. It's already been a couple of years, or at least a year, since we were talking about you know the the possibility of a new high speed high speed rail network in the United States. What was very strange about that conversation, to me, was that it was always about the federal government doing it somehow, right? That yeah. we we're doing it with federal money. But what's odd about that, and we should know, especially here in Chicago being a railroad town, was that our railroads were not originally built by the federal government. They were built by private interests. And so I think that there's a way in our fields that we often privilege the, the kind of inherent good or the inherent necessity of the public to do these kinds of large things. But historically, that's not been the case in the United States. And, and I think even in the present uh, and going on to the future, it's going to be much more hybrid, right? I mean, there's always a negotiation between these forces of, of public and private. So um, I actually don't find, you know, I don't shop at Walmart, but I don't find the, the idea that Walmart might, might actually um, kind of, uh, let's say, subsidize or, uh, or augment our, our uh, existing infrastructural system or create a new infrastructural system that we can all use and take advantage of. I don't find it that scary, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, well, I do. And, um, <laughs> and, but I think that, I mean, I think that the two projects are, are interesting because they really, um, highlight the fact that this is the, the trend in development um, uh, today more so than ever. I mean, there is this history of private, of, of private interest um, building the city, but I think that um, it's become you know, more important than, than ever, um, especially in the face where it's not like there had, there, there, it, in the olden days there wasn't a rail, railroad system, but now when something like this, if the scenario that Jesse um, presents is 
that they, we would have one crumbling system alongside a uh, new system, mm -hmm. which I think is, um, would be, it's a sort of very, very challenging situa situation to imagine. But I think that what um, I, I would um, want to talk about is that um, I don't think Jesse or Claire's projects are about saying that this is the way that things should be, that yeah. we should let FedEx or Walmart take over the world. But I think they're really in a very, I think, um, skillful way using the opportunity of this, of the uh, the minority mm -hmm. report and the scenario um, and the practice of scenario planning to speculate what if yeah. this happened. Because I think then what it does, it sort of, it sort of points to um, the consequences of that to the um, sort of line of that line sort of proceeding. And so we can then see what are some of the sort of the pitfalls and the holes. And so I think it's a really, I think it's a, in, in, in a way, it's a, it's a validation of the process to yep. say like, let's use this as a way to think about it. Because I think even though right now, this was a short exercise that we asked everyone to do, but like I would be really interested in say the second project to imagine, well, what does happen to the existing infrastructure if we have these sort of dual things going on side by side? So I think yeah. that you know it's a it's really great that you can yeah. sort of use that as a way to sort of see the holes. Yeah, and let, so let's let's back up um, away from the specifics of these two projects, and um, you know we'll talk for a few minutes about some of the the, the um, ideas and threads that run across them, and then open it up to questions for you. And Marshall, I wanted to ask you about doubt. Doubt. Well, I think it goes back to. Um, some of what Georgine was just introducing, I think that's a good segue into the discussion because I wholeheartedly agree. I don't think any of the projects are about, are saying this is what should happen. They're all asking a question of what if. And so what it allows us to do as creative thinkers is to sort of begin to um, expose uh, the limits of our own thinking, our own day-to-day -day thinking, begin to kind of expose what I would call our sort of intellectual prejudices or bigotries and, and kind of punch holes in them to where we can see other opportunities and other, other possibilities. So um, that's really important. To, to have that moment of doubt about what it is that you are so convinced of already, of being the truth or inevitability, uh, et cetera, it's critical. Because actually, when we don't doubt, when we, when we sort of assume certain official futures, this is when we run into big problems, especially at the scale of the city. So my favorite example lately is that everyone assumed that used to assume a few years ago that the value of your house would always go up in America, until one day it didn't. Right, so the whole train kind of runs off the rails because only there were only a few people out there who were who have now become very famous, right? Who submitted minority reports and said, "Well, wait a minute, you know, this can't go on forever." And and so I think that that if 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 we can, in our everyday practices, whether it's at the smaller scale of of individual actors in the city, we're calling individual actors in the city, or whether it's the scale of institutions or governments. We need to kind of open the space for that minority report, that, that moment of, of doubt that, that, that becomes the, uh, the, the, the bug or the glitch in the consensus machine. Yeah, and, and Georgine, um, maybe if you could jump in about um, the, the importance of having different voices as part of that process. Um, well, I think that um, when we think about the sort of the future of cities, I don't think that um, it's going to be one single uh, discipline that that makes the city. And so, one of the things that I really like about the the work that our contributors um, uh, uh, sort of uh, submitted was that, like, say for example, I know we want to move on to the sort of the larger the larger group, but if we just stick for one moment with the last two, I think. Um, you know, uh, Claire's project really is very, very architectural and about a sort of a specific um, moment in the city and a, and a specific spatial condition, whereas Jesse's project is sort of um, taking a step back and sort of looking at the sort of the larger landscape at a, at a regional or, a, or an inter, a national level. And I think that when um, we think about operating in the city, we have to sort of um, interweave and um, use the powers of different disciplines together. And so another way that we could sort of look at the minority report is that there are multiple minority reports and that in that, or look at the scenario plan, and that we can sort of, once we get these different projections from different perspectives, we can actually merge them together and make a more robust system. And so I think as a, as a, as a sort of a larger body, uh, I think that it's really important to sort of try to sort of expand the boundaries of sort of architecture and urbanism to include these other forces and then use them as a way to make more robust places for people tomorrow. Do you agree, Marshall? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, <laughs> um, I think there's the question of operating in cities, and, and that's what Georgine was talking about. But then there's always this pestering question of, well, is it still possible to operate on cities? at a large scale, um, which takes other kinds of agency and, let's face it, power. Mm -hmm. And so something I've been interested about, the, the, my initial interest in scenario planning um, had to do with, well, my, my research in scenario planning, well, let's go back. So scenario planning comes from the military originally, right? And so it was something that the U.S. Air Force developed in the years uh, during and following World War II. So, uh, and then it was translated into industry and now governments and institutions use it, but mostly it's large-scale actors using these kinds of techniques to kind of set up long-term strategy for strategic advantage. So I think that's something that's very interesting for me that as practitioners, um, as creative individuals, how do we um, who are looked to by, uh, uh, by the public, right, by citizens, by private organizations, by, you know, mayors, et cetera, they look to us to sort of make proposals also about the city at the large scale, at medium scales, et cetera. And so how do we, even in the work that we do, where we're still making master plans, right, embed those things with doubt or ways of dealing with uncertainty, uncertainty or what I call indeterminacy. Because the problem is that even if it's something, even if you're dealing with problems of the present, getting things done in cities takes often a very long time for various reasons. And so there's all these kinds of changes and shifts that happen in that sort of execution period. And, and I wonder, how do we design in a way? How do we tell stories in a way? How do we make drawings in a way? How do we set up processes in a way that account for that from the beginning, right? Whether it's a more, let's say, um, smaller scale uh, neighborhood-based initiative or whether it's a kind of, you know, totalizing reconfiguration of the entire region surrounding Manhattan or Chicago or anywhere else. I yeah. think it's equally valid at every scale. Well, and I'd throw in an even smaller scale um, and, you know, coming more from uh, the art side of, of, of all of this, really thinking about the, the possibility of something that um, Charles Escher, who's a curator and, and um, theorist, talks about as small models. You know, thinking about using this space of art as a way to imagine the world being slightly differently than it, than functioning slightly differently than it does right now. So little thoughts experiments and pilot projects that can help us imagine the future in different ways. And so it, it's quite exciting to think about this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue as a way to weave some of those different sorts of strategies together. So we're, we're going to open it up now to questions from you. We've got microphones down at the front, so invite you to, um, to come down <laughs> and um, join us in conversation. If you need to sneak out, that's okay, too. <laughs> we won't be offended. But, um, but please, um, do we have any, any questions from the audience? Yes, great. Uh, the FedEx and Walmart uh, projects reminded me of the effect of corporate advertising in the development of the look of our cities and how much influence they may have in the city of the future. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you guys want to say? I mean, there, there were a few projects that, that did that, right? I mean, there, there were the FedEx and the Walmart project, but also Kim Beck is clearly playing on the notion of billboards as well, and she was influenced by things that she saw in Mexico City, or for example, abandoned billboards in, is it in Sao Paulo, that they actually outlawed billboards, and so they have all these empty frameworks of billboards everywhere? Yes, uh, commerce in general has a huge effect on the image and the shape of our cities, but you know, people like William Cronin says that well, that's what cities are—they're markets. Yeah, right? and and actually, one thing that, that I mean that hasn't come up yet is also just thinking about another form of the urban imaginary, which is you know science fiction and all of the many forms that it's taken actual fiction. So imagine something like Blade Runner and the ways that you know that kind of version of the city is being totally overrun by um, by advertising on every surface um, has been such a compelling uh, kind of catalyst to help us think about um, n new futures. So here and then over to you. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, you hit it right on that one. With, when this, this is recently that the mayor came out with an idea to put advertising on the bridges. And of course, we've got our own little version, very minuscule, um, the steroid McDonald's and the Ontario corridor, where it's sort of a natural idea to say, let's take this area and turn this loose to the uh, advertising. Let Google build a tower and put as much advertising on as they want, make it 100 stories tall, 
and let them pay for the revenue of what the city needs for the next you know, 100 years. So I think the possibility of turning loose private enterprise in some areas of the city to do whatever they want to do is probably an answer to part of the problem. Do you guys want to comment that or, or, or turn it over to the next question? I think that, am I, am I responsible for that comment about turning loose private enterprise? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I don't know if that's what I would want to promote, but I think that there is this kind of negotiation between, as Jesse was looking at, regulation and deregulation, and that's an ongoing kind of push back and forth. And right now we're in one of those moments where that struggle has gotten very heated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think all of us are very interested in that question of, you know where where will where will sort of where that balance will sort of settle into into next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, quite related. Um, hello, I'm a cynic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> just wanted to introduce myself. Um, so it, uh, yeah, actually, if um, if you've ever been to Epcot Center, then you've seen a caricature more or less of what Walt Disney hoped for the future to be. Um, he was, uh, in his time, uh, a hobbyist futurist, and uh, you probably know that already. Um, and I, I think it was mostly because he was just a, a crazy man who had a lot of money. Uh, and so that, that really is my question is, you know, it doesn't cost very much, uh, who knows how much it costs, but it certainly doesn't cost as much as it would build to, uh, to build a, a theme park based in the future to um, draw plans for what FedEx would look like or what uh, Walmart like, might look like in the future. My question is, um, should we be following the money? Is, is, it, uh, is the, the, the future going to be determined by whoever has the money to spend on uh, the theme parks or uh, the new FedEx or well, the Walmart? Mm -hmm. George Ann? I think I would have um, a slightly different uh, reading of the focus of those projects on these, you know, sort of large national or sort of um, international conglomerates. Uh, for, and I don't mean to sort of not answer, answer the question specifically, but I think that um, as people who are sort of interested in space and how space is constructed and how it's used and how, and, and what it might, um, uh, come to be, we have to sort of acknowledge all the different actors in the city, and I think that understanding the logic of how logistics works is really important because I think that, um, you know, say some of us, you know, working as architects or urbanists, we have, we're not just sort of out there sort of, um, say, um, working indiscriminately, we sort of advocate for particular outcomes. And I think that in order to sort of operate in the world in which we live, we have to understand the sort of the, the needs of all different groups. And we, I would say that we have to recognize and understand the needs of something like Walmart and use that as, and, and, and be able to sort of, in designing to sort of harness that. Because um, we can't just, I don't think we can just sort of forget it and sort of let it go and do its own thing. It takes up so much space and influences so much of our life. So why not make that part of the kind of raw material that we sort of work in? So it shouldn't be that we're just sort of working in sort of these enclosed, you know, sort of office parks for the, or sort of fantasy parks for the rich, but really this is the city in which we live and we have to, I think, work with that material. Yeah, I don't think that the, um, you know, this question about should we just follow the money, I don't think that whoever has the most money always wins when it comes to shaping the future of cities. I think that, that this is an exercise about expanding the urban imagination because personally I have a sincere belief that what, what happens a lot of the times is not, it's, that it's not just about who has the most money, it's who has the best story about the future, right? Who, who can tell the story which actually brings in the, the, you know, the, all the different constituents and kind of power structures and, uh, you know, kind of movers and shakers and whoever else that you need to kind of engage in order to realize a, a vision. So at the very beginning, I mean, because we know that, that every day there are all kinds of projects that have huge financial forces behind them which don't go anywhere because they're just not good or they're not compelling or no one desires them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and one other thing I might say just in res more directly to respond to that um, question, I don't think, like uh, specifically in the second project, I don't think it's working for the money. I think that, that uh, Jesse's project is about visualizing those particular forces and I think that that is something that's a very unique role for architects and urban designers is to actually through visualizing those processes help people understand them better yeah. and then 
make better decisions about how the future can be. So um, we didn't see that so much in this particular portion of Jesse's project, but I would point to like say even Kaya's project, which had, you know, the circ I don't know if you saw the circles with the um, percentage of people studying elsewhere in the world. That is a kind of design move that all of a sudden when we see it, we understand, oh, wait a second, that's what's happening? And so that, I think, is part of the role of sort of architecture and urbanism in and this. Art. And, and art. And art. Oh, sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. a, that's a mistake on my part. And art, and art <laughs> can, can all the projects, yeah. um, they're, they're doing that. Yeah. So uh, we've got two questions here, and then I think we'll, we'll, um, we'll wrap it at that. So I, I appreciate your helping us expand our own imaginations about how we can push the boundaries. But in the last four minute, minutes remaining, I'm wondering if you can address a little bit more um, what I think is underlying all of these projects, which is um, the extent to which municipalities and other government entities will control development because of regulations and prejudices and money issues and politics. Because I think whatever great ideas you may have, it can be hard to move them. And it's sometimes they don't fail because they're not good. They fail because somebody in government won't let them succeed. I mean, I think this is actually a really interesting time for rethinking how cities are shaped because there's this sort of a, what I've observed to be almost a kind of power vacuum. A lot of cities have kind of gotten rid of their city planning agencies or renamed them, for example, what we've done here in Chicago. Uh, for the last decade or two, we've tried the experiment of having developers just do it all didn't work so great. So now there's this, I think, this new moment where uh, there's an opportunity for some other individuals to step, or, or groups or fields to step up and uh, lead in different kinds of roles. Um, so I'm, I'm more optimistic about uh, our, our opportunities to affect uh, change in cities today. Yeah, so last question. I want to take issue with something Marshall said. And Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and that you're not that bothered by the possibility or the, the prospect of Walmart infrastructure when it comes to transportation, but I wonder what would happen if it was Walmart schools replacing crumbling public schools or Walmart hospitals who determine health care. don't healthcare. we have those already? I think we do. I think <laughs> when we're talking about charter schools, we are. And if that isn't a bit scary. And, um, and also, what are the opportunities for laneways um, being injected in those areas, not just physical neighborhoods, but in areas of, say, deciding the budget instead of the federal supergroup budget deciding committee and, and um, determining health care and education outside of the constraints yeah. of the corporate and um, the political. Yeah. I mean, I think one, one thing I just wanted to call out in the question was, um, you know, the, the fact that you were kind of coming along with this scenario planning exercise that's saying, like, you know, what if all the schools became private? Yeah. That's a useful kind of extreme question to use to put out there to shift our thinking about both, you know, different kinds of policies, um, but also the built environment as well. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I should clarify. Um, as a kind of public-minded citizen and per what I consider to be a progressive minded citizen and architect and whatever else. Uh, I wish, I wish we in America could get it together to support our schools, right, and pay our taxes, uh, to support our infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing what I know about the present and the history of this country, I'm not convinced, right, that we are moving rapidly towards doing those things. That's not so much cynicism as it's just, for me, a kind of awareness. So um, again, this, this minority report exercise for me is a, healthy, is a healthy way of breaking out of that deep desire for, for that, right? For, for a stronger, uh, more, as Georgine would say, robust um, public realm, public in set, set of public investments, et cetera, et cetera. It helps me think about, well, what am I gonna do if those things that we wish would happen yeah. uh, don't happen, right? How can we still effectively uh, operate or negotiate with those forces which don't seem to be going away? Those forces of privatization which you you bring up because they you know they are 
they're there and they've, they've been present. So it's, uh, um, I, I agree with you uh, in, in many ways and I'm empathetic with the, the position, but I think the Minority Report thing is, is about testing our ability to imagine uh, other, other realities beyond the ones which we deeply desire, let's say. Yeah, and Georgine, do you wanna say anything to wrap up? I believe in democracy and I think everybody should vote. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you all very much.